We are the light and the salt. And that comes by us sharpening together. Would you stand to your feet this morning? We're going to open the word of prayer. And we're going to stay standing because we're going to play an intro video on why it's important to pray. Why it's very important to pray. Why did God bring us here? This could be actually the starting point of something of us unifying, coming together. That we're going to leave changed and transformed. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, by his word. So that we can make a difference in the spheres of influence that we need to be. It all starts at home. Some of you that are married. Some of you that have kids. That's where it starts. Some of you are going to be in ministry. And what you do from that point begins to grow. And God begins to use you. Even in spite of your weaknesses. But this is a point where you can lay your weaknesses down and get his strength. This is where you can let another brother sharpen you. As iron sharpens iron. I don't care how old we are, how young we are. There's no junior Holy Spirit. There's no junior Holy Ghost. He was around way before any of us were born. He was around. He hovered. He moved. He had God's thoughts. I'm just honored to be amongst you men this morning. And young men. Young men. Because really, men, what we do, it's not for us. There's a whole nother younger generation that needs the power and the love of Jesus. That's why I believe that the America is dealing with the fatherlessness issues, fatherlessness issue in our nation. But we can change the tide. It starts with one man at a time. Jesus was a father to the fatherless. So we can't ever think that we don't have a heavenly father. But we can also be a father to others just like we heard last night. The word of the Lord that came over Pastor Art and Casey through Pastor Eric. About them being grandfathers. Yeah, that's biblical. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It's there. So we got a mandate to continue the work of Christ. But in this era, we're alive. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time. In the city of Santa Ana, Father, we thank you for every man and every young man. We're here to come submit under your authority and your lordship, Jesus. By the way of the Holy Spirit, that you would have your way. That you would manifest yourself amongst the worship that we have for Jesus. That you would pour out your spirit upon us. That you would touch every heart and every mind. Thank you for knowing where we're at today, Lord. But we want to know where you're at. What you're doing. What you're speaking. What you're prompting us to do. That, Father, we pray that men would leave this day, today, overflowing. That their cup would overflow. That they would not be just half full or reserved. That, Father, you called them to be a priest that knows how to minister to you. Then they can become a priest of their home, a priest in all facets of life. So, Lord, we thank you for what you did last night. But today is a new day. We want a fresh touch. We want fresh manna. We put our hunger out there, our desperation out there for you. We put our expectation out there for you, Lord. Lord, would you rend the heavens and come down in this place? But before you rend the heavens, we rend our heart. Just like you said in the book of Joel, to rend your heart, not your garments. That's what we do today, Lord. As men, we rend our hearts. That you would come mightily in it. Reveal yourself to us, Lord. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit just permeate in this place and fall. Let a wind of your breath move in this place we thank you that before we even hear the word we get to minister to you Lord but Lord let a fresh fire a fresh anointing a fresh presence 
come upon our lives. All for the glory and the honor of Jesus. That we would be transformed by the power of your spirit. We thank you for every speaker that's going to be speaking today. Gather the net, God. Cast it upon this region and upon our state. That what we do here doesn't stop here. It continues to go. Because you called us to be the light and the salt in this earth. And Father, we pray that out of this are even our families that aren't here. The men in our family, the lineage men in our family would be touched. Because we stand in the gap today. And we intercede on their behalf. Believing and knowing you're a God of redemption. That you would manifest your holy power. And your outstretched arm. If you believe that today, man, would you guys say amen and give God a mighty hand clap of praise. Amen. Let's get that video on. Then we're going to go right into praise and worship. Revival. Now, Webster's Dictionary will tell you it means restoration to life, consciousness, vigor, strength. Awakening, the act of waking from sleep, or a recognition, realization, or coming into awareness of something. Revival. Awakening. Northampton, Massachusetts, 1730s. Jonathan Edwards begins to preach, followed by George Whitfield. Whitfield spoke to thousands in the open air about the concept of spiritual rebirth, while Edwards warned of sinners in the hands of an angry God. Revival swept the colonies. Countless lives began to change. Churches began to change. And history remembers this as the first great awakening. September 23rd, 1857, at lunchtime in New York City, a layman named Jeremy Lanfear kneels to pray. America was in spiritual, political, and economic decline. There was financial panic and rumors of a civil war, and so Lamphere invited thousands to a rented hall on Fulton Street to pray. Six people showed up. Just six people. But those six people began to pray. Three weeks later, 40 people were praying. Within six months, 10,000 people were gathered daily for prayer. Over the next two years, over one million Americans out of a total population of 30 million put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This became known as the Great Prayer Revival. In the early 1970s, the cover of Life magazine featured over 80,000 young people gathering for Jesus at an event in Dallas called Explo 72. A year before, the cover of Time magazine read The Jesus Revolution because something undeniable was happening. Something unexplainable was happening. Something was sweeping young people all over America. It became known as the Jesus Movement and accounted for more baptisms in a single year than any other year in the history of the Southern Baptists. 400,000 people were baptized in one year. The First Great Awakening, the Great Prayer Revival, the Jesus Movement. What's the link? What is the common denominator? What is the first step? How do things like this happen? It's prayer. The first step is always prayer. History is clear. The record is undeniable. The blueprint is right in front of us. Every great move of God begins when his people pray. Not ordinary prayer. Extraordinary prayer. Unified prayer. Desperate prayer. And so it's time. It's time to pray. It's time to pray in repentance. It's time to pray for reconciliation. It's time to pray for personal renewal in our own lives. It's time to beg God for spiritual awakening in our time and in our generation right now. God can do more in a moment than we can ever do in a lifetime when his people pray.
It's time to pray. There's enough power here to go out and change the world. And we pray that this will be the beginning of a spiritual awakening that will sweep the world. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord. Amen. There's no limit to what God can do. Amen. We say yes this morning. Lord, here we are. Use us as vessels to change the world and to step into our callings and to be a light into this world. We just praise the supernatural God. Because you've never been defeated. You've never lost a battle. For you all things are possible. For you are a supernatural. Supernatural.
all possible For you are a supernatural Supernatural You've never been defeated You never lost a battle Do you all things are possible For you are a supernatural Supernatural guy happening and we see a lot happening in the world right now right I see a lot of things happening and the only thing that I keep saying is I watch the news I watch this I see a lot of things happening around the world and I just say let God arise and his enemies be scattered amen and especially as men together the power of coming together as men and saying, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Are we in uni unity this morning? Yeah. Do we all agree that we need God to arise and let his enemies be scattered? We don't need men to arise. We need God to arise. Right? Everyone's looking 
for answers here or there, looking for a man, you know, a president or a leader, somebody to come up on the scene. Yeah, we need Jesus to come up on the scene. So I don't know about you, but when we say, let God arise, when we say, hail to the Lion of Judah, just picture this, picture God rising and his enemies being scattered, not only in, in this city, but in the, wherever city that you're part of, in your family, in your home, in your church, let his enemies be scattered this morning, amen? Let God arise. Let God arise, let God arise, and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise, let God arise, let God arise, and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise, let God arise, let God arise, and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise, let God arise, let God arise, and his enemies be scattered. Hail, hail to the line of Judah. Hail, hail to the line. Judah, hail, hail to the line of Judah, hail, hail to the great I am, hail, hail to the line of Judah, hail, hail to the line of Judah, hail, hail to the line of Judah, hail, hail to the great I am, really should war cry, really should war cry, really should war cry. Shout it out, shout it out, really should war cry, really should war cry, really should war cry, shout it out, shout it out, really should war dance, really should war dance, really should war dance, dance for victory, dance for victory. Really should war dance. Really should war dance. Really should war dance. Come on. Come on, let's stomp on the devil this morning. He's under our feet. He's under our feet. He's under our feet. He's under my 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 feet. Really should war dance. Really should war dance. Really should war dance. Dance for victory. Dance for victory. victory. Really should war dance. Really should war dance. Really should war dance. Dance for victory. Dance. Come on. Come on, dance for victory. We dance for victory. We dance for victory. We dance for victory. We have the victory. We have the victory. We have the victory. We have the victory. We dance for victory. We dance for victory. We have the victory. We have the victory. We dance for victory. We victory. Hail, hail to the line of Judah. Hail, hail to the line of Judah. Hail, hail to the line of Judah. Hail, hail to the great I am. Hail, hail to the line of Judah. Hail, hail to the line of Judah. Hail, hail to the line of Judah. Hail, hail to the great I am. Judah roar. Lion of Judah roar. Lion of Judah roar. And let your enemies be scattered. Lion of Judah roar, Lion of Judah roar, Lion of Judah roar, and let your enemies be scattered. Come on, let's let out a roar, a shout of praise. Hallelujah! One, two, three.
days you still can do now you're still that same God you can break down the walls of Jericho you can raise the dead we believe Lord you can do anything all things are possible you part the waters the Red Sea and the horse and the rider they fall into the sea and you still are that same God parting the sea parting the waves for us breaking the chains of your people like Moses. You're the same God. Amen. God of David, you slay Goliath. You are the God of Daniel, you tame the lions. You broke down prison walls for Paul and Silas. You're a mighty God. You're a mighty God. You are the God of Joshua, you conquered Jericho. You are the God of Moses, said, Let my people go. Protect this Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're a mighty God. You're a mighty God. And yesterday we proclaimed there is none like you. And today we proclaim there is none like you. Forevermore with all the saints will proclaim there is none like you. None like you. Yesterday they proclaimed. With all the saints will proclaim there is none like you, none like you.
Every hand lifted in this place, every hand. The Lord is stretching our capacity. You can't carry new wine if you're not willing to be stretched. You're not going to be able to carry the new wine if you're not willing to let Him stretch you. The Lord knew that I can't put new wine in old wineskin. So what he was saying is, in the Jewish custom, for them to pour into wineskin, they had to take it into a river and dunk it because it would become so old and frail. It couldn't stretch its capacity no more. So the person that understood the power of the wineskin to soften the wineskin, he'd have to dump it in, dunk it in water and then shape it like a, like a good baseball mitt being broken in. You got to add oil to it. But the wineskin couldn't have oil to it because mixed with the wine or the water of it, it wouldn't taste right. So to make that wineskin flexible, they'd have to dunk it in the river. What do you think the Lord wants you to tarry with him through praise, prayer, worship. It's because that's where he starts softening the heart of man. That's where he starts softening the outer shell. It's one thing to know that the Holy Spirit is in you. It's another thing when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's when Acts 1-8, the Holy Spirit came upon them that's the wine but you're the vessel if you're not willing to go deeper with him he's not going to force you if you're not willing to be stretched a little bit more he ain't going to force you he knows the point of surrender to which he can get out of you and what he can put in you that's why if he gave it all to you and your wineskin's not stretched effectively, the wineskin will burst. We can't have a new move with old 
wineskins. It ain't going to fit. It ain't going to work. This is why if you can see the consummation between prayer and worship, because some people say, well, I just pray only. But you don't know how to lift this, your hands in the glory of God. Well, some are just worship. I'm, I'm a worshiper. Imagine if God can find the total package. Oh, Jesus. Imagine if God can find the total package that every man knows what prayer, worship, and praise is. We will see the greatest moves of God come from men that are here spiritually, emotionally, and physically, spirit, soul, and body. Because you can actually be in a church service like this, but your mind's somewhere else. You could be worrying about the other things, distracted by other things. No, there's nothing like coming into his presence. David said, one day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I know of people that have come to church on a Sunday and dropped dead on a Monday. After getting powerful, powerfully touched by the Lord. It's all about preparation, man. Prayer prepares you. Worship prepares you. Reading the word prepares you. Praising prepares you. For when he walks into a room. I believe the greatest discernment we need as men is we got to discern how he manifests himself to us before we discern any devil or demon. Hello, somebody. Because if you don't have him, the devils you encounter don't have to flee. He's the king of glory. Yeshua, we thank you for this time in your presence. Every man and young man that's here, you gracefully, Father, let us enter into a place just for a moment to hear what heaven sounded like, to feel what heaven felt like, to see what heaven looked like. Oh, Lord, how we long for those moments to become more frequent in our lives. More on an every moment basis that the realm of the Spirit is accessible to men that understand their King understand their Lord and their master that God we're not trying to ever get through a conference or through a meeting through a church service we're trying to get into something of the spirit knowing that if we can enter into that place that you've so desired for us to enter into we would leave changed and transformed and you get all the glory for it and all the honor. If we can have the pulpit, men. Every voice, men. Lightly, 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 lightly. Yeshua.
whose name is wonderful, man. He's beautiful to those that feel ugly. He's the healer to them that have a broken heart. He's the deliverer to those that are in prison. He's the Savior for those that need salvation. He's a Father to those that are fatherless. He's the bright and morning star to those that sit in darkness. That's why when you say the name of Jesus, he's above all those names. You get the whole package of who he is. <laughs> Whether he's Jesus, in Spanish, Jesus. In another language, Isu. No matter what language, that they say the name of Jesus, he reveals himself to them. Would you guys put your hands together for Jesus in this place? Mightily. 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 Hallelujah! Oh, we love you, Jesus. Would you thank the Lord for the worship team? Hallelujah. Arise, men of God, worship team. Pastor Josh, thank you so much, men. I'll go to battle with any of you men any day. I believe that's what David did, Pastor Mike. Man, that, that harp this morning, Lord Jesus Christ. Carlos Santana ain't got nothing on this man, I'll tell you that. That's for real. You may take your seats, men. I want to share just briefly what this assembling is about. You guys seen the why it's important to pray video? There's one thing to study church revival. You can know it from a revival standpoint, history. But if you're not willing to put your ticket into the game, you've already checked out. Revival has to be more than a theology or something you study. It's got to be in your blood. You got to breathe it, eat it, sleep it. You got to hunger for it when nobody else is hungering for it. You got to thirst for it when nobody else is thirsty. You got to pull yourself to the table when nobody is pushing the table away. That's why I believe that people can have such deep theology about revival, but they don't walk in it. Walking in revival is when Kairos moments touch a Kairos land and you become a Kairos man. There was men in the Bible, men in church history that were apprehended by God. That you knew that person encountered the resurrected Christ. So what's this assembly about? You may be asking. What's this assembly about? Why, why would God assemble us there's a difference between a gathering and assembly. You need to know the difference. A gathering, people come and go. How many of you have ever built a table before? Or a desk? If you didn't read the directions, you wouldn't know how to do it. But you ever notice the little reading on the thing some assembly required? That's why there's a difference between assembling and gathering. Because a lot of people gather but don't know how to assemble. Jesus' body does not gather. It's bone of bone. It, he has a whole skeletal system of assembling his body. So the scripture out of this conference is found in Joel chapter 2 verse 7. I'm going to read it and I'm only going to read it one time. And I want you to take this home. And I want you to see if you're going to count yourself and say, Lord of hosts, put me in the game. 
It says this, Joel chapter 2, verse 7. They shall run like mighty men. Hmm. So he didn't say they, they won't walk. They will run. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march everyone on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. You know, coming out of a life of sin, seems like nowadays, you know, and I can use this just as a simple analogy, is people want to see unity. The Lord wants unity. The Lord wants connection. But I think gangs have a better unity than the church. Hello, somebody. Gangs have it down. They know how to infiltrate neighborhoods covertly and produce a chaos of darkness. Now imagine if the church would get that type of wisdom that if we can assemble and be unified, we'd start dismantling the forces of darkness. That's why if we know our role and we know our rank, then he will trust us with his authority. My whole family was military. My dad was drafted. My grandfather served two wars. Aunts and uncles decorated military stars, ribbons, and all four brassets, branches of the military, except for the Coast Guard. But every single one of them served honorably. And they would teach me about the art of war. I probably learned more than any history just by picking their brain about what, what the war was like in their times. And men, if you don't realize it now, we've been in a war. And the Holy Spirit's just looking for new recruits that won't say no, but say yes. So what if he's trying to draft you today? What if he's trying to draft you into his army? You're like, well, I'm not old enough. There's no age limit to the Holy Spirit. If God can set a 12-year-old boy to be king of Israel, 8-year-old boy, I'm sorry, Josiah, at the age of 8, and then Manasseh became an evil king at the age of 12, so we see one that restored the altars of worship and prayer back to Israel. And we've seen that the one at 12 restored the altars of Baal. Two young boys. So imagine, there's no age limit. But I want us to understand why we're here. It's not that we need another place to preach. I pastor a church for 15 years. I don't need to be at a place just to preach. I'm looking for hungry men, thirsty men that are willing to assemble and cry out and call on the name of the living God and say, Lord, apprehend me. Apprehend my life. Like Paul, your servant, said, let me apprehend that that I've been apprehended by. That's where he comes and grabs you. It's one thing, and I'll close with this. It's one thing when the potter has the clay. Everyone says, well, I'm the potter, you're the clay. No, he's the potter, you're the clay. But the vessel's no good until it's kissed by fire. Oh, you guys didn't catch that. Because everyone will say, Lord, you're, you're the potter and I'm the clay. He says, yeah, I need to now put you in the refiner's fire. Because fire needs to kiss you. Any potter knows that when that vessel goes into the furnace... He can't pull it out until the vessel starts making a sound. It sounds like it's whistling. That's when the potter knows he's been kissed by fire. Let's pull him out. Now that vessel is now useful for what the potter created it for. Hello, somebody. So you can ask God to keep forming you, but if you never let him put you in the, put you in the furnace of of the fire so that the fire can kiss you, you'll never come out purified, stronger than you ever have before.
You want to know what worship does? It sounds like the whistle of heaven. You guys didn't catch. You want to know what prayer does? It actually gets the potter to form you. Prayer is not about giving him a list of your needs. Prayer is like, Lord, transform me. Change me. Get everything that's not of you out of me. That's prayer. Where he grinds you to a pulp. He shreds your heart with a cat of nine tails where it opens up this way. And he starts intricately just pulling those things out that have been on the inside of your heart. And then he kisses your heart by fire and puts it back together again like the powerful surgeon that he is. And he didn't even have to give you anesthesia to put you to sleep. The Holy Ghost knows what to do. On Wednesday mornings, man, I want you to know we meet at 6 o'clock in the morning on a prayer Zoom meeting. Brother Thomas has been on it a few times. Men in this call, Doc's on there, Jim Whitney, the Jim Whitney of Long Beach, the mayor of Long Beach. No, I'm just kidding. With this. James, the son of Whitney. We got Brother Bill Landers that's been on there a few times. Terry, Pastor Terry Miller's been on there. But we need some more men. We're tearing. But we don't want to do it alone. That's why I can call on any one of these men and say, hey, let's put some together. Here's the lineup. God will pour their heart out. They'll minister unto the Lord. But they've been laboring and laboring and laboring and laboring in prayer for a lot of years. Pastor Art jumps on all the way from Pennsylvania. We got people all across the nation. Doc Rivers lives in actually from here but now he lives in Texas comes back and forth he's on here this is what we do this is what we eat that's how we slay giants and when we see a giant oh, that's bread for us I don't know, we're not there like shivering in our bones like we're not like the ten spies that brought the evil report we're like the two and they're bread for us we, can over, we are well able to overcome that's what we do on 6 o'clock in the morning. Some of you are like, oh, man, that's too early. You used to party till 3 o'clock in the morning and started at 10 in the morning. And you're like, oh, that's too early. Nah, grow a pair and get up and get on your face. Get on the Zoom call. Every Wednesday morning we meet at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 6 a.m. Maybe we got to do an evening one too. It stretches me because my, my real devotion, prayer life, and I'm not saying this to help myself up, it's when my family's finally resting. When my wife and my son's asleep, I get before the face of the Lord. And I let him stretch me and mold me. Next thing you know, my alarm goes off. Beep. It's time for Wednesday morning prayer. I'm like, Phew. That was a long night last night, but I look forward to the morning. Because a watchman knows the watch seasons of the hour of the Lord. When you do a study of that, you got to ask the Lord, Lord, what hour do you want me to watch and pray? So if you don't know that, you need to discover it. Because it's accessible to you. Amen. And then we have the Mighty Men of Prayer series. I'm going to show you a video in a moment right now. This thing will revolutionize your life. This is an eight-week prayer series strictly on intimacy of prayer. Intimacy of prayer. And this is great resources for men's groups, one-on-ones. I took my son through it at the age of nine. Graduated with a bunch of men at my church. Now this is used in the rescue mission in Fresno as part of their, basically their curriculum that for them to graduate, they got to go through this. It's going to go to Teen Challenge in the Central Valley. God's doing something with this. And I wouldn't want you to leave without you being a part of it. So we're going to bless Pastor Angel because my dear friend who's not here, who's taking care of family, his dad is 90, in his 90s. So all the families rallying around him. 
He just needed that love. And it says, man, he's doing better now that everyone came together. They put my dad in hospice four times. They said he's going to die. So we're preparing. Next thing you know, they're kicking my dad out of hospice because he just couldn't handle it. You know what I mean? He's like, I ain't ready to go yet. The stroke may have his body, but the word has his heart. Oh, you guys didn't catch that. The stroke had his physical body, but the word of God had his heart and his mind. He's still sharp in the word of God. He can quote scripture like that, but his body just can't move. So when it's his time, he'll be in the presence of Jesus. But this is what we want to bless you with. Would you guys put on the video right now? Let's watch the first video. Hi, I'm Pastor Kenton Ron, and I want to welcome you to the Mighty Men of Prayer series. I'm standing here in Yosemite National Park, surrounded by some of the most beautiful granite mountains in the world. I've lived in California most of my life, but I've never been up here in the winter. Everything is quieter and calmer. Feels like your senses come alive out here. I can smell the freshness of the mountain air. I can hear the birds and the sound of the waterfall off in the distance. I'm surrounded by the beauty and the majesty of God's creation in every direction. This is an experience of Yosemite I've never had before. Over the next eight weeks, our hope is that you would encounter God like this, and that you would learn to pray in a new and powerful way that you've never experienced before. The truth is most of us have a hard time praying. George Barna did a survey and found on any given Sunday, Eight out of 10 believers feel like they don't enter into the presence of God or experience a connection with Him during their church service. He also found that half of all believers say they haven't experienced God's presence even once in the past year. So many of us are going through the motions. On the outside, we're acting like Christians, but we're not actually experiencing or enjoying our relationship with God. Most of us are familiar with the story of Moses on Mount Sinai. The book of Exodus tells us that God called Moses to climb Sinai and to meet with him on the mountaintop. And there God's presence descended like a blazing, consuming fire. When God spoke, the whole mountain trembled and the people that were gathered at the foot of the mountain were terrified. Moses spent 40 days on the mountain being taught by God and he received the Ten Commandments written in stone. But did you know that Moses was not alone on that mountain? In fact, on one occasion, God told him to bring 73 people with him. Exodus 24, 9 says that Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and they saw the glory of God. Under his feet, there was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear like the sky itself but he did not lay a hand on the leaders of the Israelites. So they saw God and they ate and they drank. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me to the mountain and remain there. And I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandments that I have written. So Moses set out with Joshua, his attendant. Moses went up the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in plain view of the people. Moses went into the cloud when he went up the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Men, this is an incredible picture of our prayer lives. There are four groups of people described here. Most of the Israelites were at the bottom of the mountain. They saw God off in the distance, and they knew he was real, but they were far away from him. In fact, they were terrified of him. Second, there was a group of 70 elders who were allowed to go partway up the mountain and they saw the glory of God. They even met with God and communed with him. They ate and drank in his presence. 
Then higher up the mountain was Joshua, the future leader of Israel in training. He was learning and growing in his relationship with God. He was actively seeking God's presence. But only Moses lived on the mountaintop. He dwelled continually in God's presence, talking to him, learning from him, and listening to him. He was so satisfied by the presence of God that he didn't need to eat for 40 days. And when Moses finally came down the mountain, he was glowing. His face literally radiated and shined with the glory of God because he spent time in God's presence. Now, which one of those describes your prayer life? Would you say you're at the bottom of the mountain like the majority of God's people, going to church Sunday after Sunday but not really experiencing God's presence? To you, God might seem distant and unapproachable. Or maybe you're like the 70 elders. You've gone partway up the mountain and you've experienced what it's like to commune with God. You've tasted his presence and you wanna know him more, but you don't know how to get that again. Your encounters with God are few and far between. Or maybe you can relate to Joshua. You love the Lord and you wanna grow in your faith. You're seeking God and actively pursuing him in your life, but you're still not on the mountaintop. The good news is Christ has made this possible. He died for sinners like you and me. When he did that, he paved a road with his own blood to the top of the mountain and opened the way for us to come into God's presence. Now through faith in Christ, we can come and stand in the presence of this holy God, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, knowing that we are fully loved and accepted because of what Jesus did for us. Because of him, we can join Moses on the mountaintop and be transformed in the presence of God. Wow. I don't even know. Every preacher knows, man. They've read that story over and over. They preached out of multiple times. I don't know how many times Pastor Arts probably used that. But, man, it hit me today that they all saw the glory. Every single one of them saw the glory. But it was the heart of that individual that wanted to get closer. He's not saying, don't be like Moses. He's saying, do you have a heart to pursue like Moses did? So without any further ado, I'm going to welcome my dear friend, Moses. I mean, uh, Casey Dickey, the founder of the Mighty Men Movement. Would you come on up and just bless the men what is on your heart today? He's Moses and I'm a Joshua, but we go together. We work together. I love you, my friend. Men of God, good morning. Great to see you all. Pastor Eric, thank you so much for the invitation to gather men like this. What a blessing. But on the other hand, you guys messed me up last night. You guys really messed me up last night. I had a, a presentation all put together, and after last night, I went back and I said, no. You know, the, the, the preaching last night was so good, but there's got to be an application. It's one thing to hear a great sermon, right? Yeah. But then you've got to implement it into your life. So I went back, and I hurriedly kind of put something back together. And I just want to share with you guys, you know, I can't preach and teach like these two guys. And that's why I was undone last night. But what I can do is share what God has done through me yes. and in me, Amen. right? And let me start out with just saying this. You know, the Lord's eyes are roaming the pews right now of this church. And he's looking for men after his own heart like David. And there's a man, even somewhere in this church, that God can literally use to turn the world upside down, right? Amen? Amen. So, in 2000, I 
In the year 2000, I'm reading through scripture, and I run across a verse that changed my life, literally turned my life upside down. And let me share it with you. It's Ezekiel 22:30. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, or cities, if you will, that I should not destroy it. But he says, but I found not one. Not one man in, in, a, in, a, in a city, a huge city of Jerusalem. Not, you couldn't find one man to intervene, intercede. And then he says, therefore, and anytime you hear that, therefore, there's more to it, right? He says, therefore, I have poured out my wrath, my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. He destroyed Jerusalem because he couldn't find one man. And I, I, I committed that very moment to the Lord, saying, Father, I'm going to do everything in, I, in my power in our city to make a difference. And that started my, my prayer life you know, for the cities of Fresno and Clovis. You know, Ian Bounds was at a tent meeting one time, and he heard a preacher that said, what might God do with a man fully consecrated? And Ian Bounds said, I am that man. I will be that man. And how many of us in the room can say that? But what God did with the imbounds because of that, it was just amazing how God used him. But he can use every one of us in this room. My good friend, Rob Carter, always says, I am a nobody from nowhere. And that's me. And the encouragement I want to give you is that if he can use me, I guarantee you he can use you guys. Because I've got, I've got nothing to offer him other than my obedience and my love for him. Amen, guys? So in that time, I uh, grabbed a friend of mine. Because I was starting to say, you know what? Prayer is really important. And I grabbed a friend, and we began to, it was spring of 2000. And we went to our church with a boom box, and we just, the two of us began to pray. And God began to, to just move in our hearts. And I said, well, why don't we take this to other churches? Because the power of prayer can transform a church in a huge way, right? So we began to pray, and then we started uh, a prayer group at our church. And before long, we had 50 guys at 8 a, or 5 a.m. in the morning, excuse me, 5 a.m. And we worshiped the Lord, first and foremost. That's the key to prayer, guys, is the worship of him. It's not, give, you know, give me, give me, give me, Lord. There's a place for that. But it's the worship first, right? I praise you, Lord. I worship you. You are my God. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. And I love you. And God so wants that relationship with us. He so wants that. He so desires that. So we had, uh, at a point, we had started 25 men's prayer groups in churches across the city. And I would encourage any pastors that are here to start a men's prayer group. Doesn't have to be a lot of men, but there's men in this room that have started prayer groups. Dixon, AJ, in the mission. What he showed you, he didn't tell you the whole story of this. So this is being used by Promise Keepers as their primary training, uh, uh, prayer training tool. Methodist men worldwide are using this as their primary training tool. Because let me tell you what it can do. And it's, it's certainly prayer-based, right? But let me tell you the things that is how this is going to impact your life. The first one is on finding intimacy with God which is the key. That's what I found praying with men in churches is when a man finds intimacy with God, it changes everything, 
everything. It changes him. It changes his family. It changes his marriage. It changes the church. It changes the community. Right? Amen? So the first one is men of pursuit, finding intimacy with God. The second one is pursuing our identity as God's sons. Huge issue in men of the church today. Third one is men of purity. Think we got an issue with that, guys? <laughs> huh? You think, you think God wants to maybe heal men that are addicted to pornography? How it's destroying marriages? Next one is brotherhood. Man, do we need that. So need brotherhood. And so that's what this is. This is brotherhood, right? Next one is pursuing intimacy with your spouse. Wow. Does that kind of convict us? Intimacy with our spouse? The next one is pursuing the defeat of our enemy. Spiritual warfare. And I'll tell you what, when men gather in the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're pushing back the darkness with our prayers, and we're gathering an army, 6, uh, 6 a.m. prayer, men's prayer groups, get men gathering like this, great worship. Thank you, Josh. That is really, really good. Then the last one is pursuing the good news of the gospel. And in that, we filmed it up on a hill in Exeter. There was a cross on the top of the hill, and we used a drone. And, man, I'll tell you what, this will change your life, okay? I didn't want to take a whole lot of time on that, but this is really, really important, guys. We have some out here. They're regular $39.95. Give them to you for $25. Bucks. And I'm going to give you one free, Pastor, obviously. Take your men through this, please. I urge you to do that. So... So I kind of get teary-eyed because we started Men's Equipping Network and then led into the Mighty Men Movement. And we were planning a big event at the Save Mart Center. And I, wanna, and I wanna stop here for a moment, Pastor. You were talking about stepping out in faith last night, how uncomfortable that can be, right? Do we really trust God? Do we really trust God, guys? Right? We say we do. Right? We say we do, but do we really trust God? So we were planning an event in 2018 at the Save Mart Center. Doc Rivers was one of the guys that really helped us launch that with his generosity. And were we concerned about what was going to happen? It was a $100,000 endeavor. Yeah. <laughs> It's what, you, it's what you call a BHAG, right? A big, hairy, audacious goal. But in the, in the middle of planning that, and this is where I get teary-eyed, is because my wife passed away. Uh, married 42 years. And uh, took my wife, and I didn't have time to grieve, guys, because we were already planning our event. She died in July of 17. And we had this event in 2018, and we just buried our heads and plowed forward for this event. And had a great event. We had 3,500 men. And I was a little disappointed because I wanted 10,000. I'm just being honest with you. I was disappointed until over 1,000 men stood that day to accept Christ. Right? And that's, when you, and that's when you say, I, I trust you, God, with whatever. I, I have to trust you with my wife's death. The day it ended, I, a buddy gave me a cabin up at Shaver Lake. And it was like, now what, Lord? Now what? But it was the men. The men who came around me, prayed for me, encouraged me. I apologize, guys.
A year and a half later, gave me a new wife. Blessed me. A woman of prayer. Just blessed me. So I want to, this part of it, I just want to encourage you guys that what God can do with messed up men. The great story in for Samuel 22. As you remember the story, David's running from King Saul. King Saul wants to murder him. He's jealous. David hides out in the cave of Adullam. He's in distress. And if you go to Psalm 142, you can read David's prayer. I don't have time to read it. But he's crying out to God in, in despair and distress. The scripture tells us his mom and dad come, come into the cave. And then 400 men, like you guys, like myself, messed up men. Men in heavy debt, men discouraged, serving under, under Saul. And in that cave, they begin to train together. Brotherhood, right? They're training together. And if you can envision... If you close your eyes for a moment, you can envision this cavernous cave. And you know they had probably a big fire going 24-7. Well, David was a man of prayer. David was a worship leader, right? So you have to know, it doesn't say it in Scripture, but you have to, you have to know because he, David was such a strong prayer man that probably those guys gathered around that campfire several times a day, probably, and in that time, they found this intimacy with God. And what's the evidence of that? Okay, it doesn't say that in Scripture. What's the evidence of that? Well, then you fast forward to 2 Samuel 23. And it's David's mighty men. And you look at the, the top three guys. Joash, Basabeth, I call him JB. He said he killed... 800 men with a spear on his own. Eleazar says he fought so hard against the enemy that the, the sword froze to his hand. And scripture says a great victory was won that day. Then there was Shema, who stood in a field of lentil beans, which was a, for the troops, that was a, a crop that was important. He stood in front of the entire army of Philistines. And again, Scripture says a great victory was won that day. How could a man do that? How could any of us stand before that kind of an army on our own and be victorious? It's because they knew their God. They had intimacy with God. And they knew God had their back. Amen? Amen? Those men had their king, King David, right? We have our king, King Jesus. Amen? So I use this, this part of my presentation. I just I want to encourage you guys that God can use every single one of you men in this room, every single guy in here. If you just say the most dangerous words you can say, Lord, here am I. Use me. That's, those are dangerous words. I'll tell you what. You say those and watch out because God is going to use you. He's going to use you in a powerful way. He doesn't want men sitting in the pews like this Sunday after Sunday. He wants men out of the pews onto the battlefield because we are in a war. Amen? We need, we need men on the front lines. We need soldiers, guys. We need an army to push back this darkness that is encroaching seemingly more and more every day. So I want to... Uh, there, that's the application. Get in a men's prayer group. Start one here. And watch what will happen, Pastor. What, what God will do with that. One other quick story. Charles Spurgeon pastor, English pastor, had a pretty large church, and often he'd have 
pastor's visit, this church in England, and they would say, show us around your church. He'd say, would, would you guys like to see my boiler room? No. <laughs> we want to see your church, pastor. Well, I want to show you my boiler room. What? No, would you show us your church? I want to show you the boiler room. They go down to the basement. They open the door. There's a hundred people on their faces praying, praying over that church. Spurgeon knew the answer, and the answer is prayer, right? So I want to transition here real quickly to I want to introduce a, a new ministry to you guys through the Mighty Men movement. So could I have that map up there? Well, you really can't see it very well. Uh, anyway, on that map, in Fresno, Clovis, we have over 500 churches across the cities. Over 500. I want to close, have you guys close your eyes just for a moment. I want, you to, I want you to picture this. What if, what if men from the churches drove through neighborhoods, praying over the neighborhoods on behalf of Fresno PD as well, what kind of impact might that have on a city, right? So this is what City Watch is. You know, how many of you guys love Santa Ana? I imagine most of you do, right? Because this is the city God led you to, right? Psalm 10, 107, 6, 7 says, In their misery they cried out to the Lord, and he saved them from their troubles. He led them on a straight road to a city where they could live. So God leads us. Over one half of the world's population lives in cities. Not only does he have, does he have a heart and love for cities, but calls us to love our cities. He calls us to love our cities. He also has great passion over cities. He brings healing. He brings connection. He brings blessing. In Jonah 4.11, God says to Jonah, Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. Not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? He loves cities. In Luke 19, 41 through 42, he says, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept. He cares about our cities, guys. Do we care about our cities? That's the question I have. In Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7, it says this, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, say to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, Build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Then he says in 29.7, Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you to live. Or into exile, it says. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Man, if we want to see our cities transformed, it doesn't start with compelling sermons, perfectly constructed arguments, healings, or elaborate demonstrations. It starts with prayer. God's asking us to pray for our cities and play a part in the peace and prosperity. And with that, I want to let you know that this new ministry called City Watch we have a partnership with Fresno PD and they're working on Clovis PD. They've endorsed us. And here's what our police chief, Paco Balderrama, says. Fres we support City Watch in their efforts to increase the safety and trust in our communities. So what is City Watch? What is City Watch? Guys, it's men going out, men of the church, 500 churches in Fresno, Clovis, men going out two by two. It's like sending out the disciples, two by two. 
in your vehicles, you're driving through neighborhoods, either a, a rent circling your, your church, driving through neighborhoods to, for two purposes. Number one, you're patrolling the neighborhoods, watching for anything that's out of place. I just, ha I just watched a Channel 30 news where these young, young men, groups of these young men are walking through the neighborhoods, pulling on car doors, trying to steal cars. Well, if we can make a difference in that, if we see something like that, we'll have a special number to call in to PD That'll be, that's always answered. And we don't engage with anything like that. We do call in. And we have an experience, because uh, we started this actually 10 years ago, and then we set it aside. We have an incident where two of our guys were patrolling in an area where, there's, uh, where businesses were, and this was in a parking lot of a um, restaurant. And these two guys were patrolling, and they saw a car in the parking lot with the trunk open and three or four guys around it. Well, they called PD, they went over, and it was a drug bust. And that, so our guys made a difference in that. So the second piece of the puzzle is this, guys. We do engage with the neighbors. So we'll have placards on our cars that say City Watch. And we, if we see people out water in their yards, things like that, we're going we're gonna to stop and we're going to let them know we're City Watch. And our church, New Covenant Community Church, is in partnership with City Watch. We're trying to protect our neighborhoods, right? So the second and most important piece of City Watch is as we're patrolling, we're praying over the neighborhoods, praying over the neighborhoods. What kind of impact do you think that might have? If we know prayer is powerful, would it have the capacity to totally change the atmosphere in a neighborhood? ultimately change a community, ultimately change California? If we had churches, can you guys, uh, can you put up the slide on um, the next slide up, please? Since we we're, since were coming down here in Santa Ana, I wanted to show what your guys, your cities are up against, right? So why do we need a city watch in the city of Santa Ana? Can you show the next one? <clears throat> Here's your annual crimes in Santa Ana. Violent. 1,424 property, 7,567. Crime rate per 1,000 residents. You can see the statistics there. Out of 100 cities, 100 being the best city, Santa Ana right now is 11th. So do you think you guys could make a difference in those statistics if you had churches? You, had, you guys, had, I looked it up, you guys have 100 churches here in Santa Ana, 100. What would happen if just five or six guys from every church went out and started doing this, praying over neighborhoods all over the city? I got to believe, and I absolutely, totally believe that that will have an incredible spiritual impact on the city of Santa Ana. Is there one more? So the crime rate in Santa Ana is considerably higher than the national average across all communities in America, from the largest to the smallest. Although at 29 crimes per 1,000, it is not among the communities with the very highest crime rate. And I got to tell you, Fresno, we have similar issues in Fresno. It's not just Santa Ana. The chance of becoming a victim of either violent or property crime in Santa Ana is 1 in 34. That's 9,205 residents will be affected by either property crime or car thefts and such. So Santa Ana is not one of the safest communities in America. Relative to California, Santa Ana has a crime rate that is higher than 80% of the states, cities, and towns of all sizes. You guys have issues. Every city has issues. This is something going on in our nation, and the only thing that's going to change that is the power of prayer, guys. You believe that? 
Again, we are called to seek the peace and prosperity of the city where God placed us. Because again, if the city prospers, we also will prosper. And that's exactly what we're, we're trying to do in Fresno. That's where we, we'd love to start it, see it started here in Santa Ana. Then you can gather with other pastors and say, wow, what if we did this together? One great way to unite churches, right? Across all denominational lines or whatever, we have the power. We, we can't all be preachers and teachers, but we can all pray, right? And we can have kingdom impact. And that's my heart is kingdom impact. So, Josh, could I have you come up real quick and just play something soft? Because I want to pray over you guys. And I'm going to challenge you guys. As, as Josh is playing and I'm praying, you know, if you guys have a heart that wants to see change, if you have, guys have a heart that want to begin to apply some of the things we've talked about, not just, not just take in, but then apply to your life. If, while I'm praying, if you guys feel you, you, want to, you want to make a commitment to change, to take another step in your walk with Christ, I encourage you to come up. And then we'll have a pastor pray over you guys. So, Heavenly Father, Father, we gather this morning in your name. Father, we come with great humility this morning, Lord. Because as, as I stated earlier, Father, we are nobodies from nowhere. We have nothing to offer you. And Father, what I've seen you, how you've rendered the heavens, Lord, how you've placed planets and solar systems and galaxies, Lord. You've set stars in place. You've called them by name, Lord. And yet for some odd reason, Father, we are your pride and joy. Father, we don't understand that. We don't get it. But, Father, you are real. And, Father, you are the God of transformation, Lord. And, Father, last night we were a bro bunch of broken men and women here, Lord. And we watched... Pastor AJ gave a powerful message to some of these men and women, God. And Father, one of the men told me as I was praying for him last night, Lord, that he's stuck. He's stuck where he's at, Lord, and he, his wife is telling him if he just takes that step, that God can change him, and he's wondering, can that really happen? And we prayed for that last night, Lord. So I pray this morning, Lord, if men that are willing to take that step of faith, willing to get out of the pews into, onto the battlefield, join us in this army that's being built. <coughs> Lord, there's men praying all over this country, Lord, crying out to you, Father, for revival. But, Father, the revival is going to start with each of us first. So, God, would you draw them in? Bring them up, Lord. Give us men of courage, strong, courageous men, Lord, that this army can be built, that will have impact on the city of Santa Ana, the city you love. The Father's going to take men on their knees before you to make a difference, Father God. It's time for men to rise up, Lord. Men of the church, Father, to rise up, be the husbands, be the fathers, the grandfathers. So, Father, we call the men up, men willing to change this morning, Lord. So we'll just wait for a couple minutes because we want to pray over you that we would see kingdom impact in the city of Santa Ana, kingdom impact in, in this church, Father God. So, Father, we say thank you, Lord. We ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Come on up, guys. Come on. Come on. Come down. We want to pray for you. Gather up here. Pastor, come up. 
proud of you guys for being here. What a blessing you guys are. Men of courage that are willing to take another step in their walk with you, Lord. So, Father, we ask that you would bless these men. And I'm going to ask Pastor Eric to pray over you. Thank you, Casey. Father, I'm so humble to be among mighty men of God. That, Father, you just continue to move upon all these men, Lord, and especially the ones that have come up. For you said in Ezekiel 37 to prophesy that you would breathe upon them and they become a great army, an exceedingly great army. You are raising warriors at this time, Lord. And so, Father, I release a warrior anointing to come upon them as the mighty men of David that anointing that they had to fight the enemy and have victory because you've already given us the victory. So Lord, let that fresh anointing come upon these men that will change, Lord, first their homes. we got to start at our homes, Lord, and that there will be an impact in our homes. And then in our churches, Lord, there will be a greater move within every church that is represented here. And in our cities, Lord, we can change the city, Lord. We can change the government, Lord. Father, I release that fire anointing that come upon these men. For even as Jeremiah said, that the word of God was upon them like a fire in his bones, Lord. Let that same fire become in these men, Lord, that they can't stop from praying. They won't stop from praising and worshiping you, Lord, no matter what time, no matter where we're at, Lord, that the Spirit of God will rise big within us, Lord, because we want change, and we know change starts with us individually, and then change will flow out of us and to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Wow. That's where it all starts, man. Feeling the tug of the Holy Ghost. All right. Well, the one thing, man, you can go back and take your seats. We're going to continue on with the service this time. You know, the Mighty Men movement is all about strategic relationships. The four branches of our military, the army, the Marines. Is there any ex-military here? Thank you so much for your guys' service to our nation. Would you guys put the hands together for them that served our country? The reason, the reason why I say that is because how many know God's army has formations? The one thing about a prayer warrior, he has armory at his excess. First of all, you need the whole armor of God. Don't ever take your armor off in battle. You'll be a casualty. Okay. But the army, my dad was in the army. Uncles were in the Marines. Uncles and aunts in the Navy. Uncles and aunts in the Air Force. And they all had their strategies of war. My dad was a point man in Vietnam. So it, it was either his job to either be the first one to get taken out, which would let the other team know that they just came into an ambush, or they had to let them walk through just so that they can try to ambush them from a different direction. My dad would tell me, he really went through some mental warfare after Vietnam. Came back drug addicted. They were shipping drugs through body bags from Cambodia, Vietnam, back to the States. And he would tell me, he says, son, I didn't know who God was. I knew who there is one. But he would have to stay at watch nights while the platoon would rest. He said he would have a wingman or a partner 
they would face back to back with their shoulder, with their weapons up. And if the one who says, okay, you go to sleep, rest. I'll watch from this direction. So they would switch in and out. The reason why I'm saying that is because some of you in your prayer life are created to march into areas that nobody else can march into. Then we got the Navy that knows how to launch from a ship. They don't even have to be on land. They can be out in the sea. Boom. Cannons. Missiles. Just leveling the playing field. Then we got the Air Force that knows how to fly from above and drop artillery by the tons into air, enemy territory. You got to know which part of the army you're supposed to be in and be effective in that area. Don't try to be something that you're not. If God told you to be one who's going to be on the battlefield, be in the battlefield. If God's trying to tell you you're going to launch from a, a boat, stay in the boat. Why? Because Jesus was in the boat. Hello, somebody. And if he's called you to launch from the air, then do your part. We'll see greater victory when men understand their placement, their rank, and their order in which they're supposed to call to pray. Okay. Don't take it lightly. And this is why the Mighty Men Movement, Million Man Called to Prayer, City Watch, Men's Equipping Network, are with the Rise Men of God, we build alliances and strategic partnerships with each other so to strengthen the armor and the army of God. Amen. We're not trying to be everything. We're just doing our role as the mighty men movement of what God called us to do. With that being said, I want to welcome Bill Landers, who's part of Men for Nations. I asked him if he would come share for five to ten minutes here because he lives in this area, but the headquarters are in basically Virginia, Washington, D.C. So, Bill Landers, would you come up from Men for Nations and share what's on your heart with us this morning? try to keep this uh, under 10. <laughs> I want to encourage you guys this morning regarding uh, hearing that certain sound. And in Judges chapter 6, after Gideon, who had had that just previously, that encounter with the Lord God himself, and the Lord said to him, you know, go in that gumption of yours, if you will. And so what did he do after that? He went and he tore down the altars of Baal, and that stirred a hornet's nest. And in verse 33 of Judges 6, it says, Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites, the people of the east, gathered together, and they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. So they were hot on Gideon's trail. And in verse 34, it says, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and then what? And then he blew the trumpet, and the Abrazites gathered behind him. In verse 35, it says, And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulon, and Naphtali, and they all came up to meet him. And that's where we got the 32,000 that assembled together. And we know that beyond that, that God pared it down to Gideon's 300 and then they went off and uh, sent the enemy running. But what happened? The ones who had gone home for various reasons, for fear, or they didn't take the water up correctly, so to speak, they weren't prepared. After Gideon's 300, 
sent the enemy running, the rest came. And so in this hour and in our time, we need men who will stand and get the enemy running. And uh, then courage will arise. And then uh, those who lack courage for various reasons, they'll be strengthened and they'll get in the battle. So we need, we need everyone. And um, so I want to share with you for just a few more moments. I want to review one more time. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. The Lord wore him like a glove. Then he blew the trumpet. 1 Corinthians 14.8 says, For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? In uh, March of 2005, I heard a certain sound. And it was the sound of the founder of Men for Nations, Dick Simmons. And it was a voice trumpeting an anointed message. It was a booming, shaking call out of what I knew, complacent Christianity and learning that I needed to have clean hands and a pure heart so that I would be able to ascend his holy hill. And it was an invitation into true kingdom living and responsibility as a man. It was like when Jesus said, come and see. It was that kind of a call. And I knew it was a call to come and pray for 21 days to develop my prayer life. But that is not what I heard. I heard a call to battle. <laughs> I heard a call to war. And I remember sitting in that old wooden pew. It was that kind of a church in Harbor City, California. And uh, I remember sitting there thinking, okay, all right. So where do I sign up? And I remember early on as a youth uh, in the early 60s when John F. Kennedy was president and shortly thereafter when he had been assassinated. And when I heard his quote, and you all probably know it, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And I used to yell that. I used to stand in my backyard and yell that. I don't know why. It just impacted me. And so I believe God is asking, quite frankly, along with everybody else, where are the men who will stand? And it's not a big ask. Why? Because he's already paid the price. We're not our own. We're not our own. And so here we are in 2023, and our nation has unbelievable, desperate needs. And still, I believe within all of those needs, the greatest need is for the men of our nation who know King Jesus to arise and shine, to be that raised up standard against the flood of pervasive darkness and no longer being asleep and remaining silent. And in uh, Matthew 13, 25, it says, but while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. For far too long, so many men in the church have been asleep, have been complacent. And so what happened? The enemy comes in like a flood. The spirit of the Lord, however, will raise up a standard against it. And you guys are that standard. <clears throat> so in Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2, it declares, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. His glory won't be seen upon you by just hanging out in here all the time 
we've got to be out amongst. We got to be out in the streets. So our nation, gentlemen, and the state of California, we need prayer, yes, but we need a prayer movement mixed in with a men's movement because men are builders, they're warriors, uh, they're fighters, they're entrepreneurs, they're adventurers, and you combine all those components together. When men come together under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ, what can he do? He brings strategies. He brings assignments. So we need men who will come together unashamedly for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to submit to one another because none of us are greater than any one. So we come together, we lock arms, and as Pastor Art always says, locking shields together as one. And uh, I want to end with this. I've got so much, guys, to share, but I only have an allotted amount of time. When men are connected... And when men are praying, it removes what? It removes isolation, complacency, and opportunity for cowardice. When men pray together, it brings action and it brings assignments. And when men pray together, when they are in one accord, it brings unity and boldness. And one of my favorite scriptures is out of Acts 4. You guys know the scenario where they were thrown in jail and then they were released and uh, the enemy was threatening them. And, uh, but they came together in verse 31 and it says, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Men, the urgent need of the hour is truly a national call for men to assemble and report for duty. And so, uh, Father, I just pray in the mighty name of Jesus that your praying leadership throughout California, that your praying leadership throughout this nation, Lord God, would send forth that certain sound, that they would send forth that trumpet call, Lord God, assembling the men of our nation and the state of California, locking arms and locking shields in every county. Father God, I pray for Gideon's 300 men in every county within the United States of America, locking arms and locking shields and preparing for what's ahead. And finally, uh, in 2022, at the pray vote stand at the uh, Family Research Council that they put on every year, Governor Sam Brownback, who was there in his closing remarks, he said, the harvest is big and there is a storm coming. It's a big rolling storm. Be in the storm. We're in a critical season, and we need every combine in the harvest. Don't let up. Ride hard. Don't just go fixing fence. May we be found in your fields at work in these days that you have given this generation. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Come on, somebody. Thank you. You know, men, when you hear the sound of heaven, trumpet repentance, in the earth it sounds like thunder. Every great awakening was because those voices of the Lord started with repentance. 
it's not watered down. It's actually the place where man exchanges his will for the will of God in their life. You never stop repenting. Never. Until the day you are no longer have air in your lungs. Amen. Thank you, Bill, for sharing that word. Amen. I've been in positions like Bill where they called me and we connected and they said, you got two minutes. Like, all right. That's enough for the Holy Ghost to move. I remember I was at Fresno City Hall. They called me last minute, say, hey, can you come pray for the mayor right now? I said, all right, I'll be there. They go, you got two minutes. Okay. Showed up. God moved. Next thing you know, it's all over Facebook and all kinds of stuff. It was like, I, didn't, I wasn't there for that. I was just being obedient to the assignment. Every person in an army knows how to respond like that. If you're one of the ones that say, well, I just got to drag out of bed. No, no, no. Get in your knee holes. Build some knee holes. Your knees are waiting. Your, your knee holes are waiting for those knees to press into. Because that's your prayer spot. Amen. What we're going to do right now is we're going to take a break. If you need to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. There's some tables out there. Go visit the tables. Then we're going to come back and finish this up. Um. But we're going to come back with one song of praise. Then we're going to receive an offering. Then we're going to finish up the rest of this conference with the last two speakers. And one more. Amen? All right. Stand to your feet. Let's get some marching orders. Get those legs moving, those bones moving. Amen? Before noon. Ten minutes. Ten-minute break. Amen?